as much as they do on the American Dream. <laughs> but the first thing I have to do uh, is to thank all of you for coming today. There are lots of people around the table and around the, uh, the outside that I don't get to see nearly often enough. So I appreciate very much your coming out on a day like this where you obviously had alternatives. It's a beautiful uh, spring day in uh, Texas, but you chose to be here, so I appreciate that very much. I have uh, been very much interested in the idea of the American Dream over the course of the last 15 years or so, and uh, I've written two books about it. The first book in 2004 was this one called Pursuing the American Dream, Opportunity and Exclusion Over Four Centuries, and I like that cover art. That's a famous 19th century uh, painting uh, uh, called Westward Ho, or the movement of a country uh, westward uh, with the angel uh, leading uh, forward. Uh, and in this book, I was, uh, uh, I was uh, confident that the American dream had been a guiding ideal uh, of the country from its founding period uh, forward, and that the idea of American exceptionalism had something important to it. And that idea of American exceptionalism was that America peculiarly was a country, had always been a country that gave the common man a better chance to succeed than that common man had anywhere else in the world. And that Benjamin Franklin was the uh, exemplar of the, uh, the uh, 18th and 19th century common man uh, from a family of 14. Uh, the tenth son in that family uh, rising by his own efforts and intelligence uh, to stand before kings, as was often said about him, that he had risen from obscurity to be a, uh, a figure known throughout the Western world. And for most of the 18th century, even the last quarter of the 18th century, a more famous man than George Washington uh, until after the, uh, the revolution. Uh, but as I looked at the American dream over the course of the nation's history, the idea that the dream was real and that the idea that this was a country that gave common people a better chance to succeed in everywhere else than anywhere else seemed to me to be more true at some points in American history than at other points in American history. That, that politics had created uh, uh, an environment in the first half of the 19th century, uh, in which the common man actually did have a almost universal uh, opportunity to succeed by going west and taking up land. Uh, and that at other points in American history, uh, the 1950s, for example, the post-World War II era, it did seem to be true that common people, like my father, who worked in a mill all his life, had an opportunity to get a good, solid, middle-class job that you could raise a family on and, and feel proud and confident that you were taking care of yourself uh, and your family, but that at other points in American history, public policy had gotten out of whack and the opportunity that seemed uh, available to people had, had waned and people were nervous and concerned uh, that, come on in, please, uh, that they were not uh, as likely to succeed as their, uh, their uh, parents had been. Uh, and those would be periods like the age of the robber barons, the 1880s and 1890s, huge corporate power structures uh, in which uh, people uh, had difficulty finding a place. The 1930s is another period uh, where opportunity seemed to recede in a dramatic way. And the period from 1975 to the current day, in, in parts of that period, has also seemed to be one in which people uh, struggle to find an opportunity to succeed. But uh, the idea of this book was that if public policy had, in fact, made opportunity available broadly, at some points in our history, it could again. And so the last chapters in this book were recommendations for public policy uh, changes that would make opportunity more broadly available by gender, by race, uh, by providing educational opportunity uh, to allow people to, uh, to strive and succeed. But the last 15 years has treated that book roughly 
uh, the uh, the public policy changes that have been made have not. Uh, and I, this shocks me. I assume that once I told people what needed to be done to restore the American dream, that they would move on it with alacrity. Uh, but they have not done so. So I've been uh, forced to write a second and uh, and more dreary book. Uh, this is the the academic retreat. You know, write another book if the first one doesn't seem to uh, uh, to hit uh, dead center. So this is the more recent book. Uh, from late uh, 2016, and again, uh, I like that cover. Uh, this book uh, is The American Dream in History, Politics, and Fiction, uh, and uh, parts of this book uh, overlap with and are in fact uh, blatantly taken from the first book, particularly the parts that deal with our great political leaders, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, uh, what is new and is the reconsideration in this book is my looking at great American fiction for how it has treated the American dream. Has, has our great fiction, going back to our earliest major novelists up to yesterday, treated uh, the American dream respectfully as something real that people can strive for with a good chance of achieving, or has it treated it dismissively? And the answer is the latter. It has treated the American dream dismissively. Our great literature has been uh, a series, unbroken series really, uh, of cautionary tales about the American dream uh, pursued and lost. And so I want to spend most of my time uh, your time today uh, talking about that, uh, but I will end, uh, as was indicated, uh, 35 minutes or so, a little bit less than that from now. So in this second book, uh, what remains, well, what remains of the first book is the sense that, that our political class and our economic and social elites that, that support the political class have uh, used the American dream, the idea that the country is open to the aspirations and the effort of common people uh, to suggest that that is always true and that success is to be lauded and that failure, uh, the sources of failure are to be sought within, uh, within individuals, that if you fail, it's uh, as a result of inadequate effort, perhaps inadequate capability and talent. The most recent wonderful example of that uh, view uh, is by my great friend Richard Fisher, uh, who might well be with us here today, uh, and I'll have to find out why he's not. Uh, but if, uh, if you read the Dallas Morning News on Sunday, which I imagine most of you did, Richard had a wonderful uh, opinion piece in the Dallas Morning News in which he describes his father as an abandoned orphan, almost orphan, uh, in Australia at the end of five, sleeping under a grate and begging for food until he was arrested by authorities that put him in other Dick Dickinsonian kinds of settings uh, uh, for abandoned children. Uh, and that his father rose from those ashes to become uh, a, uh, an entrepreneur uh, of, uh, of various sorts, you know, really uh, skittering from one job, one opportunity for another, and, and succeeding uh, uh, late in a handsome sort of way, uh, but, but always enjoying his scotch a little too much. Uh, but his son, Richard, Harvard, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, and that that is, in fact, the American story. And it is an American story. There's no question about that. Many people in this room came from humble backgrounds and have established themselves uh, uh, in admirable uh, and, uh, and very comfortable ways. Uh, but, uh, but that is not the only American story, uh, and it's not the one that I'm going to spend most of my time on today. But I do want to highlight uh, the main themes of the American dream as it's presented 
uh, by our culture authoritatively to all Americans as uh, the injunction to strive and succeed. Uh, and that is that there have been three images uh, that our great political leaders uh, from the early colonial period all the way to, uh, to uh, Lyndon Johnson and Ronald Reagan, uh, Barack Obama uh, dramatically, uh, but not yet Donald Trump, as we'll see, have offered as design elements of the American dream, as descriptions of how the country must be organized if it is going to provide the opportunity broadly to its citizens that American exceptionalism uh, promises. The first of those images uh, is to see America as a city on a hill. Uh, there's a chair right here. Uh, to see America as a city on a hill and that phrase uh, comes first from the Bible, but then in American history uh, from a speech made by John Winthrop in 1630 on the deck of the Arabella, the flagship of the Puritan fleet bringing uh, Puritans to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And John Winthrop said that uh, they were in a covenant with their God to create a city on a hill that would be a model for uh, for good Christians in the rest of the world about how to, uh, to design their communities and how to live. And that idea of a city on a hill has been used by political leaders from, from Winthrop forward, very famously by John Kennedy uh, in a speech to the Massachusetts uh, uh, legislature, but then in his uh, inaugural address uh, as president as well. But the great president that I, that I want to hold up to you today with the idea of a city on the hill is Ronald Wilson Reagan. Huh? Ronald Wilson Reagan in his 1989 farewell address. I always keep him guessing, right? That's the way to do these lectures. I always keep him guessing. Uh, Reagan, in his 1989 farewell address, spoke of the city on a hill. And he said, I have spoken of the shining city all my political life. In my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks and stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, a city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity, and if there had to be walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. After 200 years, she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness toward home. That is not Donald Trump, by the way. Right? That is Ronald Wilson Reagan, and it shows how far we have come uh, over the last 30 years or so. But that idea of America as a city on a hill, as a home for those who must have freedom, uh, from whatever dark place they may come from uh, has been central to the vision of the American dream. The second uh, image that is meant to inform how the country must be organized if the American dream is to be real is the idea of a balance between the dollar and the man. The best statement of this comes from a man named Orestes Brownson, who you may well be forgiven for not uh, having heard of before, but he was an Andrew Jackson kitchen cabinet member. He was a journalist uh, and speechwriter for Andrew Jackson. And so the idea that, there, that society must maintain a balance between the dollar and the man was central to Andrew Jackson, but is seen in many other presidents as well. Uh, including Lyndon Johnson, and this is what Brownson said. <clears throat> we believe that property should be held subordinate to man and not man to property, and therefore that it is always lawful to make such modifications of property's constitution as the good of humanity requires. And so that is the idea that, that Congress should legislate in order to ensure that the distribution of property in society is not so unbalanced that the small man doesn't have a chance to start out with some chance of succeeding. And if that dollar becomes too powerful and outweighs the man and that man's future opportunity, uh, that the, uh, the nature of property can be redefined to ensure that opportunity remains vibrant. And the third idea uh, meant to inform how society should be organized is the idea of the fairly run race. Uh, 
And this is an idea that Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, and many others have drawn on uh, Lyndon Johnson recently. This is Theodore Roosevelt. He says, our ideal is to secure a reasonable approximation of equality of opportunity for all men so that each man shall have the chance to start fair in the race of life to show the stuff that is in him. In other words, that society needs to be organized in such a way as property doesn't outweigh opportunity. And you can think of that as a fairly run race in which everyone isn't expected to start even and finish even but people who are naturally more uh, uh, constructed to run, who are better trained, better uh, uh, prepared for the race are going to fin finish ahead of those that aren't. But if you bring someone who is a trained athlete up against someone recently released from chains, denied opportunity for a long time, and say, all right, the starting gun is about to, to go, you two race, it's evidently unfair. This is unworkable, undemocratic. So those ideas have meant to shape people's sense of the kind of society that America is meant to be if opportunity is to be uh, widespread. But our great national fiction has said no uh, to that sense of the broad availability uh, of opportunity in the American dream. Let me say before I start talking about these novels, uh, I have not, you know, out of mercy to myself, uh, read a great deal of the secondary literature from English departments and those kinds of places about these, <laughs> these, you know, yeah. God knows I love those people, but, uh, <laughs> but there is such a huge literature on each of the great American novels that has a depth of detail that is not useful for what I'm doing here today. What I'm asking today is what was the top line message in great American novels to the readers of that day and afterward? What did the average reader of The Scarlet Letter or Moby Dick uh, or Freedom more recently, uh, uh, what message did they take away? Was it a message supportive of the American dream or was it a series of cautionary tales about the forces in life that can disrupt and destroy one's attempt to do the right thing and strive to achieve the American dream. So I've read these novels as the average reader would have for the top line message about the American dream. And it is almost always that there are forces at large in the world that even the best motivated, hardest working people uh, cannot overcome. And those forces are, are several, and I'll just mention a couple of them in a couple of the novels that we'll talk about uh, in a little more depth going forward. Nature is one of them. Uh, the sea and Moby Dick. Uh, uh, fires, droughts, you know, things that you can't prepare for and necessarily overcome. Uh, four people up in the panhandle were killed by wildfires two weeks ago. Similarly, uh, wildfires... Uh, west of Boulder burning today. I mean, if you get caught in some tremendous act of nature, there's not much you can do. Human nature is varied uh, in novels. Aristotle talks about something called natural depravity. Uh, and uh, novels like Billy Budd, uh, Melville's Billy Budd is a novel about a, a wonderful young man, a, a seaman. Uh, uh, he is illiterate but noble kind, well-loved, uh, but a person, uh, Master at Arms Claggett, forms an anathema to him for no apparent reason and acts to take Billy Butt down. And Billy, being an open-hearted good kid, doesn't see it until much too late. And so Aristotle's natural depravity is the idea that there are people driven and motivated by powerful urges that you may not see in time uh, Absalom, Absalom uh, is, uh, is another novel where uh, I will uh, try to touch on where, uh, where there are people that the average man cannot uh, anticipate their actions and prepare well for them. Uh, chance and fate is another. Random events uh, or the cards that one is forced to play can, uh, uh, can crush aspiration. Culture. 
can limit aspirations for women through most of American history for blacks and other minorities. Class, you think of, uh, uh, of Grapes of Wrath uh, and a, a good family slowly broken up by the uh, uh, pressures of the Great Depression. Uh, and we'll talk about a number of others. I want to start by talking just a little bit about chance and fate and the difference between those two things. <coughs> I have spent almost all of my time in this, uh, in this book talking about our greatest novels. Not just novels, but the, the premier novels in American literary history, from, uh, from Scarlet Letter to Moby Dick all the way forward, John Irving, those you know, the, the sort of top line novels, not just, not just any novel, but uh, I undercut that claim by starting with a short story. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, in 1835 wrote a short, short story called The Ambitious Guest. Uh, and uh, this is a great little story about a 17 year old who is launching himself out into the world. He's got a basic education, he's got a good heart, He's talented, he's hardworking, he's aspirational, he has plans uh, to succeed greatly and to have his name go down in history. Uh, and at 17, he's traveling through the mountains. Uh, it's cold, it's windy uh, in the winter, and he sees uh, the light of a farmhouse. And there is a farm family in that house, fireplace, the grandmother is nearest the fireplace. It's just a beautific scene and so this young man goes in uh, and spends time with the family and he tells them about his aspirations and his hopes and his goals and they share with him their aspirations and then on the road outside a wagon goes by with a load of drunkards on it and they are whooping it up and cheering and cursing and and they think about stopping in the farmhouse as well and decide not to and go on uh, and uh, the family goes to bed with their guest and they fall asleep. Uh, and an avalanche comes down a mountain toward the house and they've known about the possibility of avalanches. So they have built a shelter out away from the house and the father and all of them break for that shelter. Uh, and the avalanche divides as it comes to the house, separates around the house, leaving it untouched and killing the family and the guest as they flee toward the shelter. And so the idea is a young man, well prepared, very attractive character and this fine family warm around their fireplace, struck down unexpectedly. They thought they'd have to flee, they fled. The house is fine, they're all killed. And the bad guys on the wagon got away. They just chose not to stop. The kid chose to stop. So that idea, that chance, is uh, an element of life uh, that can undo all of your great efforts uh, is an idea that I wanted to, uh, uh, to start with. Uh, but fate uh, is an idea related to chance, but, but quite different. Chance is that lightning strike uh, unexpectedly. Fate grind you in a particular direction toward destruction. And Moby Dick is the classic example uh, of uh, fate in the world that cannot be resisted. Uh, and you all know the, the story of Moby Dick, so I'm not gonna go into it in detail, and I uh, am uh, uh, rapidly running out of time anyway. But I do wanna read you a couple of things that Melville says in Moby Dick that give a sense of what novels portray uh, as the field upon which individuals live and compete, the way the world is uh, as we pursue our goals. And so in Moby Dick, uh, Melville says, I, chance, free will, and necessity, no wise incompatible, all interweaving together, the mingled mingling threads of life are woven by warp and woof. Calms crossed by storms, a storm for every calm, there is no steady, unretracing progress in this life, ifs eternally. Great phrase, ifs eternally. It's not Benjamin Franklin where you work systematically toward, toward your goals, but it is uh, uh, ifs eternally. No steady, unretracing progress in this life. Uh, 
and then a second one, the world's a ship on its passage out, not on a voyage complete. One most perilous voyage ended only begins a second, and a second ended only begins a third, and so on, forever and for aye. Such is the endlessness, yea, the intolerable, intolerableness of all earthly effort. So those ideas in novels that there are, uh, that uh, fate uh, can't intervene no matter how well you proceed. The constraints of culture, I'll mention just very quickly, starting with the Scarlet Letter. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Scarlet Letters, 1850. This is Hester Prine, uh, the Puritan woman uh, who sins with uh, the minister uh, and uh, uh, pays a tremendous price. She is constrained as a female within the Puritan culture to be a wife and a mother and to be no more and to adhere to the cultural precepts of, of Puritanism that Hawthorne believes and she accepts by the end of the novel as authoritative that she did sin uh, after she gets Pearl, her daughter situated in Europe, she comes back to Boston and lives out her life with the scarlet letter on her breast as her culture says she must uh, and has herself buried some distance from the minister Dimsdale because they couldn't be close in life they can't be close in death, so she has herself buried near him, but not with him because she agrees that violation of both religious and cultural principles uh, is unhealthy for society. And that was Hawthorne's view. Uh, it's less our modern view, but it is uh, in the Scarlet Letter. Uh, similarly, Theodore Dreiser and Sister Carrie toward the end of the 19th century, uh, Carrie Meeber, is a young 18-year-old come up out of the rural Midwest to Chicago uh, looking for an opportunity to start a life uh, and finds that for a young woman uh, the only uh, pursuits that are possible uh, are uh, sewing and other kind of female pursuits. Uh, singing is the way she finds uh, out of uh, poverty and danger. Uh, but uh, uh, it is a narrow path. And in fact, Horatio Alger, who wrote all of the uh, up by your bootstrap sort of stories in the middle of the 19th century, wrote uh, one book about women uh, called Helen Ford. And he talks about the narrow choices available to women that mean they are not uh, on the same path to the American dream that men are. So culture continued as a restraint. And I'll just mention Sinclair Lewis's Babbitt. Uh, Sinclair Lewis was uh, the leading novelist of the 1920s. Uh, and the uh, Webster's Dictionary definition of Babbittry and Babbitt is a person who is, spe and especially a business or professional man, who conforms unthinkingly to the prevailing middle class standards. Babbitt's a great book. You'd enjoy reading it if you uh, haven't already done that. Uh, race is. A, uh, a major topic in American literature uh, from the middle of the 19th century forward, and race mixing uh, is a major subtopic that we won't have time for uh, today. But Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852, uh, has uh, uh, a, a slave family, George, Eliza, and Harry. Eliza is the slave wife and mother who runs across the Ohio River on the ice. Uh, uh, great tale. But George, Eliza, and Harry are fleeing uh, a plantation uh, situation. Uh, and they're going for Canada. Going for Canada. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, they, and, and George says, uh, what's the use of our trying to do anything? Trying to know anything? Trying to be anything? What's the use of living? I wish I was dead. And so that idea that in slavery, there is no reason to try because it is denied you. A uh, hundred years later, Bigger Thomas in Richard Wright's Native Son says, why should, why should I want to do anything? I ain't got a chance. I don't know nothing. I'm just black and they make the laws. They don't give black people a chance, so I took a chance and lost. Uh, so that idea that the American dream is not available 
is also in Toni Morrison's Sula uh, and in Beloved, but Sula, uh, she has uh, the following line. Sula and Nell, girlhood friends that go through life together, separate and then come back together late. Uh, uh, Morrison says Sula and Nell both, quote, had discovered years before that they were neither white nor male and that all freedom and triumph was forbidden to them. Uh, Mark Twain talks a lot about, uh, about race and particularly about race mixing in Puddinghead Wilson. That's a wonderful book. If you've read the main Twain, you may not have seen Puddinghead Wilson, but I recommend it to you. Go see it. Uh, John Steinbeck on class, I won't uh, talk much about. I want to talk just briefly about the ephemeral nature of achievement in most American novels, and then we will, uh, we will dedicate a little bit of time to the great man himself. Uh, and how much of uh, the lessons from American fiction he may have understood uh, in this, this last election. The ephemeral nature of achievement uh, is a theme in novels, and that is even when you win, uh, the pinnacle up on which you stand is uh, uh, likely to crumble. Uh, there is a William Faulkner no novel called Absalom, Absalom, uh, uh, that has uh, this line in it. Uh, Thomas Setpen is uh, as ignorant as it is possible for a young boy to be uh, until he emerges into the plantation culture of the South, is uh, intimidated by it, flees and makes himself a, uh, a huge plantation owner in Mississippi. And he says, at that peak, which all the different parts that make a man reach where, it can, where he can say, I did all that I set out to do. And maybe this is the instance where fate always picks out to blackjack you. Only the peak feels so sound and stable that the beginning of falling is hidden for a little while. Uh, Philip Roth, many of you will have read Philip Roth uh, over the years. He wrote something called the American Trilogy, which is a three book series between 1997 and 2000. He talks about two people. One of them is named Swede Lavov. Swede Lavov is a Jew in the middle of uh, the American 20th century who sees a, a clear shot at opportunity as finding a place in the white uh, upper middle class of America. So shedding or, or supplementing his his Jewish character with access to the white middle class. Uh, so he joins the Navy, he marries a, a Miss New Jersey, does all kinds of things, and he feels as if he has won it all. Uh, and, uh, and he says uh, to his wife, Dawn, we own a piece of the dream, Dawn. I couldn't be happier if I tried. I did it, darling, I did it. I did what I set out to do. And if you know that story, his daughter Mary joins the 1960s underground and sets off a bomb in a post office randomly killing someone and destroying his pastoral sense of control and he spirals downward from there uh, and he says futile every last thing he had ever done the preparations, the practice, the obedience the uncompromising dedication to the essential to the things that matter most the systematization of futility is all it had been. I recommend to you The Human Stain, uh, a uh, character named Coleman Silk. Some of you may know that story. Uh, and I'm going to, to move past uh, the, uh, the rabbit series to the great relief of most of you. John Updike's rabbit series uh, and a couple of other novels, uh, Richard Russo's Empire Falls, and Jonathan Franson, if you don't have a good novel going right now, those are relatively new. Franson in particular, novels called Freedom from 2010, is worth a read. Uh, and so I want to I want to close uh, in uh, under five minutes with the idea that that while these novels provide insight about the hurdles that stand between people in the American dream, they provide very little sense of of how to get over those hurdles, how to get beyond them, how to actually realize the American dream. What novels tell us is that it's not as simple as our political leaders in their campaigns 
would have us believe, elect me and I'll restore the American dream, uh, but that there are all kinds of things that we cannot account for, plan for, uh, that can <clears throat> knock us off our course in life and might well uh, destroy us. But social science has offered uh, some insights uh, that give us a sense of how we might proceed and this has been going on for uh, half a century. Uh, in the middle of the, of the 20th century, uh, C. Wright Mills, Nathan Glazer, Daniel Bell, and others were talking about changes in the American society that was moving opportunity away from wage laborers, <coughs> blue collar workers, uh, people who uh, in the quarter century after the end of World War II uh, had uh, felt uh, strong and proud in their accomplishments. Uh, more recently, there are three books that I'll mention to you quickly. Uh, Robert Putnam uh, at Harvard has written a whole series of books, one of them you probably know, Bowling Alone, from uh, 20 years or so ago, about the breakup of community and the fact that individuals used to be embedded in all kinds of community and now you find people bowling alone. His most recent book is called Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis. Uh, and, and that book is about his small town community on Ohio where he graduated from high school and his family had those sort of middle class jobs and he goes back and it's destroyed. Lots of unemployment, lots of opioid abuse, lots of just terrible uh, dynamics and, the, and, and how hard that makes it for a young person in that kind of a setting, to have that Benjamin Franklin aspirational striving to climb out. Uh, and there's a line in there uh, that says from one of these kids, you know, partly, you know partly it's just history. Opportunity leads to opportunity. People don't recognize how hard it is if you're born with headwinds, how hard it is to move up compared to someone who's just got a tailwind helping them along, which is a a neat idea. Thomas Piketty, capital in the 21st century, talks about uh, wealth disparities increasing over the 20th century. Uh, and Raj Chetty and his colleagues in economics have been doing studies of locational opportunity, where in America the American dream still exists and where it seems uh, not to exist. And so I want to suggest to you just very quickly that Donald Trump uh, had a couple of dramatic insights uh, that, uh, that he rode to the presidency. And two of those have to do with the three ideas of the American dream that I talked about early on. One of them, the balance between the, the dollar and the man. I think that Donald Trump understood more clearly, certainly than Jeb Bush or Hillary Clinton did, and a little more clearly even than Bernie Sanders and, uh, and our own junior senator did, uh, that there are a great many Americans in the country that feel distraught, uh, disempowered, uh, saddened by their surroundings and the opportunities that they seem to present. And he spoke to those people uh, very directly, and that may well have helped him win uh, in, uh, in the Midwestern states where he did so well. And that idea that, that America is not the fairly, one, fairly run race. Uh, that America as currently uh, configured uh, is one where the 1% has great opportunities uh, and can pass them on to their children. The 99 have fewer uh, opportunities and the bottom 30 or 40% uh, feel the absence of those opportunities. So I think Donald Trump won the presidency uh, based on a, a, a partisan identification that is much more stark uh, than it was when Jim and Harold and I and, and most people in the room were, were young, uh, where there was a large crossover voting. Donald Trump won 92% of the Republican vote even in a context where many Republicans took a long time coming to him, they actually ended up there. And then you put on that a layer of, uh, of uh, small town, rural, Midwestern people feeling left behind and without opportunity. And that I think smoothed the way 
uh, to Donald Trump. Whether or not Trump can, uh, can uh, govern in a way that convinces both of those groups, particularly that rural small town group, that they're heard, that policies are in place that will improve opportunities for them, I think very much remains to be seen. I doubt that that will happen. I think that, that Republicans are sticking, that is sort of the general Republican Party is sticking with, uh, with Donald Trump because they believe he's going to give them policies that Paul Ryan and the congressional Republicans were looking for. So uh, I don't know what that means for 2018, uh, much less 2020, but I think it will be difficult for Trump to reproduce uh, his uh, performance uh, in rural small town America uh, in another run. But I'm sure people differ with me on that. I would be happy to be corrected and to talk about anything that you are interested in. You've been extraordinarily patient. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm tempted to ask if you discuss at all any of Ayn Rand's novels in your book, but I want to go beyond that because my main interest I said is great American novels? It's <laughs> 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 still very popular with a lot of teenagers. I, popular ain't great. <laughs> but here's my question. It really has to do with the role of religion as part of the American dream. You touched on it only briefly yeah. with respect to the Scarlet Letter. So here's, here's what I see as, as the dilemma here. On the one hand, the social gospel of Christianity, for instance, teaches you to put a priority in helping the marginalized, the poor, the downtrodden, which could be the basis for arguing for a, a forward-looking good immigration and refugee policy, for instance. On the other hand, Christian uh, doctrine is also cited by people who are opposed to abortion, who want to discriminate against homosexuals and, and transgender people. So you have, and then there are a lot of people in, in Trump's uh, whole following who want to see us go back to the so-called Judeo-Christian roots of, of America. So you have this role, this big role that religion plays, but it can be used to justify all sorts of different policies. Mm -hmm. My view of Trump is that he's simply a pragmatist. He wants to take advantage of religion when it helps him, ignore it when it doesn't. So what's your view? Yeah. Yeah, this is this is a, a very broad and important question about <coughs> not quite whether America is a Christian nation, but the role that religion played uh, in uh, early American history as, as opposed to the, the role that it plays now. In early American history, uh, religion played a profoundly important role. And those, uh, I don't know, Christina, did you take American political thought? American political thought and also the religious class of Professor Wilson. Yeah, right. American political thought uh, uh, has a theme uh, about the, the, the uh, colonial and founding period through the 19th century, uh, particularly in Washington's farewell address, but lots of other places uh, where religion uh, is seen as absolutely necessary. In fact, even Jefferson and Franklin uh, saw religion as absolutely necessary. and. Uh, it was religion as the foundation of morality and morality as the foundation of law-abidingness. That in a nation where you weren't going to have a big police presence, you weren't going to have a standing military, you needed people to obey the law of their own volition. And if religion made people moral and morality made them abide by the law, that that generalized civic religion was critically important. But denominational religion has not usually played uh, a fundamental role in American politics uh, in the 19th century or up into the 20th century. It's been present, it's been part of the battle, uh, but it hasn't been part of, uh, of the American dream. Uh, and uh, as you suggest, uh, it provides levers for all kinds of arguments to be made uh, about what policy should look like. You want to follow up? to make it more pointed? Well, uh, your notion uh, about the early, I mean, the notion of Republican virtue, obviously, was, was clearly a highlight of, of the whole Founding Fathers philosophy. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I certainly understand that. Great. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Have you read Hillbilly Elegy? I have not read Hillbilly Elegy. Uh, <laughs> it brings your story. It's it's not, it's fiction. Yeah. I mean, it's non-fiction. It's not, it is not yeah. fiction. Remind me of the guy's name? Um, J.D. Vance. Right, right. Yeah. 
But I read it and I thought, now I get it. Now I understand <laughs> who Trump was appealing to, uh, in part. I mean, yeah. some Trump scary type people. But there's a whole group of people out there that were described in that book. And yeah. Trump knew how to get to them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I have two brothers, and both of them worked on the docks in Portland uh, all of their lives, or at least long enough to get a, a pension. And then they drove rural mail routes for a while, and now they live uh, the good life in Thailand. Uh, and and my, my, uh, my middle brother uh, was home when I was visiting my mother, and it was just before the election, and I was explaining, and he watches Fox News all the time, is telling my mom, that she wanted to educate herself on the election, she should watch Fox News. And I was saying, no, Ma, don't do that. Uh, you know, Hillary's going to win. There's no question about it. You know, just, just uh, don't worry about it. Hillary's going to win. Democrats may well take the Senate. And my brother said, no, I don't think so. I think Trump is going to win. And he said, all the people I went to high school and that I talked to, uh, many of them are, are Democrats say they're going to vote for Trump. And I said, ah, shit. no, not, not going to happen. I mean, that might happen, but Hillary Clinton's still going to win. Uh, so I gave lectures all over this city and state before that election. And the one that sticks in my mind most uh, is uh, I went down to Herbert Hunt's ranch outside of Glen Rose, Texas. And, and he had 30 of his investment partners in his living room uh, to, uh, to hear a talk on the election so they could get ready for what they thought was the inevitable. And I went down there and I explained how Hillary was going to win. They were sad, but, uh, but not terribly nonplussed. They knew they'd be comfortable anyway. Uh, but, you know, I thought it was clear. I thought it was very clear. So I told anyone who would listen uh, that I thought Clinton was going to win. Uh, so that is simply to say uh, I didn't see it coming at all. So what I tell you now about 2018 and 2020, uh, you should consider with that in mind. <laughs> yeah. Now that yeah, you've said that, there. now that you've said that, uh, and you look at it and say, "Oh, I believe she was going to win," why do you think she lost? Why do you think she won? Uh, well, <laughs> leaving the Russians aside, yeah, leaving, uh, uh, yeah that's a distraction <laughs> no. that really one has yeah. to look at as McCarthyism and yeah. a lot of others. I think that I think that that both political parties uh, lost sight of uh, much of the country, particularly that part of the country uh, that has struggled since 1975. If you look at a lot of the empirical data on income, uh, 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 on, on education, on all kinds of things, it plateaus <clears throat> between 1973 and 75. And then those of us who have decent income, decent income, keep moving up, taking a larger share uh, of the good things available in the society. And the bottom half, the bottom 40%, third, whatever it is, falls further behind. And they've been working for 40 years without very much uh, increase in living standard. And I think both parties miss that to a large degree. Uh, Donald Trump did not. I think Hillary Clinton missed that to a large degree. And that's why I mentioned her and Jeb Bush together. I think neither of them ever would have saw that. They would have offered alternative policy proposals, but neither of them would have been very effective for rural small town America. But I'll also tell you that, that John Irving and the Rabbit series and Richard Russo, Empire Falls, that's what those books are about. They are about the decline of opportunity in small town America where the rising generation sees nothing to, uh, uh, to strive for. Uh, but where Trump found it, I do not know. Uh, and if anybody has a sense, uh, uh, you know, that was before Bannon, uh, where he came up with the idea that there were people out there who he could address uh, on, uh, you know, think of Miralago and think of Trump Tower and this guy as the, the vehicle for speaking to left behind small town America? Okay. I got two brief comments. First of all, Trump did not win the election. The only reason he's president is we have a, a totally obsolete, irrational electoral system in this country. Any other country, any other democracy in the world, he loses the election big time. 
Two. I want to apologize to James Madison. <laughs> 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 we're free to change our, you know, constitution, and even we can even change the electoral college without amending the constitution. Right. Um, on the American dream, I think before us, in assessing the continued viability of the American dream, and I agree with a lot of what you said, you have to compare it to other countries. Okay, we okay? go. That, you know, the American dream certainly has eroded, and we have a lot of problems with inequality of income today. But look at America next to other countries. You know, I'm not here to apologize. Yeah. So, but compare it to other countries, and I still, still think there's a lot to be said for America, you know, America. Can I just, one last yeah. quip. <laughs> when, when, when was Bill Clinton elected president? 1990. Yeah, I was invited to some dinner. And uh, George Will was the speaker. And he gets up there and he says, um, one of the great things about America is that anybody can grow up to be president. And that's the risk we take. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said that almost exactly that same thing. Though. Yeah, a right. Abraham Lincoln wasn't. That's what I mean. That by that period, the American dream made uh, made perfect sense, and it still makes sense today for uh, uh, for a great many Americans, but not as many Americans right. as it once but did or to should. England or France or Brazil. Or That's the problem. Uh, <laughs> that that is no longer true. It is yeah. no longer true that opportunity is greater in the United States than it is in many countries in Europe. And it hasn't been true for the better part of a quarter century. Was it ever true? Yeah. Uh, the Piketty book has something about that, but there's a lot of other stuff that could be said. My question would be, be was it ever true? I mean, I, I don't know how many, how many in the room are not Americans in here, but I mean, I've always had some great misgivings about this American exceptionalism idea. Well, certainly in the 19th century. Because, I mean, how, you know, if most people who make these arguments uh, are not doing you know, what Robert was suggesting, which is comparing it to other countries. I mean, we, we have the Canadians in the room here. I mean, I, I'd like to hear about the Canadian dream, you know, how that yeah, compares yeah. to the American Come to the States. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, uh, there's some writing on that. Uh, a, a fellow, uh, former colleague has written a piece just earlier this month, I think, called The American Dream Has Moved to Canada. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think it's true. Our experience is, is much the same. And I think it's an old world, new world, question in some okay. ways okay. if you yeah. want to look at it. People were escaping class systems in which they were they were yeah. they were yeah. born yeah. to rise only to a certain level and, and right. the right. American dream, <laughs> meaning kind of Canada and, and the US right. was sold to them very much in the same way. Yeah. Come over, break free of the class yeah. systems, yeah. you know, yeah. it'll be up to you to to write your your future. Yeah. You you I think there's no question that so through the nineteenth century and perhaps into the 20th century, uh, free land, all that sort of stuff, made it kind of mm -hmm. obviously true, uh, but decreasingly so over time. But our cities are, are our small towns and uh, and rural communities are facing very much the same problems in, in Canada and, and having very much the same reaction. Trudeau, however, rode in on a different kind of sentiment offering a hope in a different way mm. right. but it's it wasn't i don't think any different and and there's some some uh, you know there's facing some backlash from that too yeah thank you i have a, a genuine question uh, but let me frame it a little bit I that's not I'm, an aspersion on some of these other I, questions I'm, is I'm, it uh, <laughs> <begging to, laughs> an actual <laughs> question yeah an actual actual question. Okay. so i'm begging to differ on most of what i'm hearing in the um, and i'd like you to comment on the shifting demographics because you said you went all over the state, so I guess you know Texas pretty well. I'm, I'm Hispanic. I'm the son of a man who hitchhiked here from Mexico. I had a nephew deported last month. And I have to say, I have lived the American dream. I believe in American exceptionalism. I've lived in Africa. I've lived in Europe. I've lived in South America. I've worked in the Middle East. And this is the best thing going, and that's why people want to come here. You know, when, when uh, Colin Powell defended the United States, and he said, well, if all these people hate America, how come outside of every American embassy and every consulate, there are lines of people that want to come here? Let me submit to you, that doesn't happen in reverse. People aren't dying to go into the Middle East or into Africa or into Latin America. So there's something going on, whether or not you believe in American exceptionalism. There is something uh, unique and powerful about this country and its ability to allow people to move up and achieve. I've lived the American dream. I'm the son and grandson of peasants who were illiterate. My kids have gone to the finest schools in Europe and the United States. And what I see in the Hispanic community, here's my question, is that every generation is actually doing better than the previous one. 
even among the poorest immigrant Hispanics. And that, uh, would you comment on that? Because I, I hear, I don't hear anything about that. And, uh, and we are the future. We will demographically be the majority. Yeah, yeah. Uh, chapter three of Lone Star Carnage. I recommend it to you. Uh, that, that's a book I wrote uh, five or six years ago on exactly these questions about whether Texas is doing everything it needs to do to prepare for a Hispanic majority later uh, in the first half of this century. But as I said uh, before, you know, I spent 15 years on this idea of the American dream and American exceptionalism in a couple of books, and I wouldn't have done that unless I thought that there was something there, something well <coughs> worth not only commenting on, but, uh, but revising, restoring, uh, pointing to, but also pointing uh, to weaknesses in it. Uh, and uh, on the demographic question, it is certainly true uh, that uh, people are lining up around the world to come uh, to the United States, and that once they get here, they tend to do better uh, over time. Uh, but uh, there are differences. All of the sort of white uh, Southern Eastern European ethnics that came between 1880 and 1920 took a couple generations to, uh, to blend into the American middle class, and now you can't find them, can't see them, can't differentiate them. Uh, but Hispanics have been here for a very long time. Uh, and while I congratulate you on your success, it is still true that Hispanics in Texas today make 60% of what Anglos make uh, and have for the last 50 years with very little upslope. Uh, people differ, Jim knows more about this than I do, on how likely and how quickly Hispanics will uh, integrate into the American middle class. And there's lots of writing on the fact that, that blacks are unassimilable. Yeah. And whether that remains true over the rest of American history, it has certainly been true to this point in American history. You have to remember that what you're assimilating into is constantly changing. Yeah. It's constantly shifting. That's true. And I do agree that one of the things that Trump saw was that America's position in the world has shifted. You know, it's not like it was in the 1950s. You know, my, my Japanese wife of almost 40 years says, wouldn't you love to go back to the 1950s? I mean, America really was top dog. So we're not that anymore. So To which you answer no, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, our society and our economy are shifting. They're in flux. And a lot of this does have to do with our changing position in the international division of labor, if I could use that term. Um, but I remain optimistic that we will meet those challenges. I'm not sure Trump doesn't seem so optimistic about that. He wants to pull up the drawbridge. All right. Then I'll come down here. I, I think that the <coughs> meta trends gave Trump the chance to win that election, but I think James Comey is the one who gave it to him. <laughs> Had he not said what he did with the tailwind behind Hillary at that point before he said it, what would you be saying now if he hadn't said what he did? Yeah, see, I think there are so many things that may or may not have affected the outcome of the election that it's hard really to, to point to one and say that was it. The question that I would ask is how could it possibly be that Donald Trump was close enough yeah. to Hillary Clinton in that election uh, to, uh, to benefit by some small thing that might have happened? And I think... You know, I, I give a lot of talks to Democrat groups, and I say, look, uh, you can stand around waiting for Donald Trump to tip over and you pick up the pieces, or you can ask yourself what the hell was wrong with, with the candidate you offered and the policy proposal that you offered in that election that let Donald Trump uh, be competitive in an election where he should have been beaten by 20 points. Well, that was the meta trend that he took advantage of. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, there's a kind of, it, I think all of us are, are accustomed to a kind of a leisurely flow of history. Things just happen. It goes back and forth. <laughs> the pendulum swings back and forth. Now, we have Trump as something very new on the scene. He, he has speeded up history as it is. Like every day, history seems to go faster. So I have a question, <laughs> a personal opinion. What do you think, Matthew, uh, making a future 
prediction here. Will he or is he permanently changing the speed of our history? And uh, or can we ever ever again enjoy the leisurely past, or will it always be what we have today? Yeah. Well, you know, I have thrived on uh, on history moving in slow motion, which is the reason I became an expert in Texas politics. Uh, you know, things don't change very fast, and even I can follow them, and you know, even be a step ahead occasionally. Uh, I, I don't think that Donald Trump is uh, is changing the pace of history permanently. Uh, I, I do think, uh, you know, there, there are just all kinds of things uh, going on. Some of them are, are, are planned uh, by, uh, by Donald Trump and, and those close to him. Others of them, I think, uh, are not so much planned. This, this tweet about, uh, about President Obama tapped my phones. Uh, I don't know that that was, that was planned. So, uh, you know, I think, that, I think that American political institutions are strong and that Congress and the judiciary are already playing a checking and balancing role and that, that things will slow down. The problem for the Trump campaign is that they might, uh, that if he loses the health care bill, for example, it would be very difficult to bring up tax reform or immigration or, or any other big bill. So. Uh, it could slow down dramatically for Trump. Uh, I don't see it uh, as a situation in which he's going to win a series of important victories, sort of win on health care, win on tax reform. I don't think he's well enough organized for that or as his administration. So I think things are going to slow down. And after Trump, uh, not comes the deluge, but comes probably a slower history.